over the mist-shrouded marshes full of pale, moonlit worms. Past the gallows tree where the witch's neck was lengthened. <laughs> and through the corpse-strewn cemeteries of Danville lies Castle Dienerstein. In its darkened dungeons, the mad doctor Bryce von Dienerstein. <laughs> and his horribly deformed assistant, Sam Tigor, work bringing to life their most terrifying creation. Book Report Podcast Halloween Special Welcome to a terrifying episode of Book Reports Podcast. I'm Sam Tyler. I'm Bryce Steiner. And on our special Halloween episode, we decided to dress up in costume. Bryce, I just want to say your strong bad costume is fantastic. I mean, you've got the gloves, you've got the loose door mask. Only thing is the oil on your chest is starting to glare in my eyes a little bit. Well, it's part of fame. I also love your Magnum P.I. costume you're wearing. <laughs> This mustache took forever. If, let me tell if you. Tom Selleck is dead, he is rolling in his grave. And if he's alive, he's digging himself one. <laughs> so this is a special Halloween. And as we all know, Halloween time, there are the crazy goblins who run around knocking over mailboxes, egging houses, and TPing garages. And we have one right here today, Jaws Fat Christopher Wright. Good to have you here, JC. Thank you. I'd like to point out I've changed my ways, and I am not liable for anything that may or may not happen in the next 24 hours as a result of this podcast. <laughs> Good disclaimer. I wanted to ask Over. you, what what is the scariest book you've ever read? Um, uh, maybe Brave New World by Aldous Huxley. Interesting. Huxley. That is a pretty terrifying book. It is. When did you read it? A couple years ago. A couple oh years ago. I think it was before med school because since then... Oh, you yeah. couldn't possibly have read it after going to med school. Exactly. All I read is <laughs> in the hairy cell mutation and crap. Like... What scared you about Brave New World? The fact that it's pretty similar to society. Okay, yeah. And also the fact that the heroic character in it, the noble savage, first of all, supposing the noble savage did exist, which Actually, they don't. Take a second, explain the idea of noble savage, please. Okay, basically that if you take a man and free him from all the influences of society and don't corrupt him, he'll be awesome. So that's dumb. Uh, all you have to do is look at yourself. I right. mean... So, so society is what corrupts us. So, so what about the noble savage in this book that really frightened you? He's the only reasonable escape from society. He's mm. the only thing that doesn't fit. And then he ends up hanging from a ceiling fan. Saying, you know, the only rational response to an irrational society mm. is suicide. There's one other character who's kind of above it all, and he ends up controlling the society. Right, right. This very utilitarian, you know... Humanity is a bunch of trash and it needs to be controlled so that it may mill about the disposal in a uniform mm. fashion. That's the other alternative. So you can either become a cynic or you can become a dead person. Or you could, even worse, become one of the people who's utterly lost in entertainment. Do you feel, though, since it is a dystopia, is it making the point that one of those two things are good or that we need to avoid those two things? You know, I'm not even sure I'd go so far as to say to avoid. I think at the point they happen in the book, there are accidents of the society. Okay, so they're already inherently in. There's the foregone okay. conclusion. What a shame this isn't the book we're talking about I today. Know. <laughs> I mean, we could, we could switch. We've all read it. <laughs> Don't worry, listeners. I haven't read it either. <laughs> Bryce, did you read something depressing? Oh, I you? guess that's what the intro of my book. I think it is. JC <laughs> <laughs> introduces me. It's a nice change. <laughs> JC is taking over the podcast. He's just, he's gone mad with power. I just wanted more depression. Let's be honest. <laughs> oh, you're in luck. You're in luck. Yeah. Welcome to the Book Reports Podcast. The Book Reports The book. most depressing podcast. <laughs> The book I chose for this month, knowing that we were doing a Halloween special, oh! Oh! <laughs> is Curses Broiled Again by Jan or Jan Harold Brunvond. I'll just say Professor Brunvond because he is a professor of urban legends. And Okay. Yeah. I don't know how you get that degree. Like, like, like folklore studies? Yeah, or, exactly. That's pretty that cool. Is, yeah. Uh, he talks a lot in this book about making friends in like Europe and like Australia and stuff like that with similar people. So it's not just like a one-time <laughs> so degree. There's like, an the, underground of folklore studies. It's not just that one lady yeah. on the early seasons of Mythbusters. So Sam, I think you've just found your doctorate degree. I, I think so. I think it's time for me to get going Sam on Sam Tyler, doctor. 
doctorate of urban legend. <laughs> Either that or master of divinity. The other, <laughs> the other really good one. So Curse of the World Again is one of several books that he's actually written about like urban legends, and he shares like a lot of the stuff. Like he actually had like a newspaper column that he would like share. Hey, this is one of the urban legends that we've heard about. Apparently, Anne Landers is one of the big urban legend spread interesting I was, yeah. wasn't picking that and so he attacks her a couple times and he's like you know oh here's another one by Ann Landers <laughs> watch out everybody <laughs> is, is he saying that she made them up or that she spread I think that because she's so popular uh, that but yeah that she was like a her. megaphone for this and, okay. and she's like hey watch out for you know potatoes <laughs> <laughs> that is honestly the best vegetable you can make any like 20 different dishes with it and you know your stomach thinks <laughs> Bryce can only count up to 20 <laughs> <laughs> you know, regardless of what shape it enters, your stomach, you know, it comes out. It comes out yeah. mashed potatoes. Your stomach, <laughs> your stomach only knows that mashed potatoes exist. Your stomach only knows one recipe, to be fair. And that's poop. Mashed. Yeah. <laughs> mashed. There's a lot of urban legends that he shares in here and stuff like that, and like a lot of really interesting stories. There is one he shared about Halloween, and if you will indulge me, I will. Uh, you know, the whole idea of we better take our candy to the hospital to get an x rayed. Oh, yeah. Yeah, to yeah, make yeah. sure there's no razor blades in it. Like, that's one of the things, like, my parents wouldn't let me go trick-or-treating because, mm. like, razor blades and poison. There's better heard? ways to kill kids. <laughs> Casey, as, as, a, as a studying medical professional, would you please share with us the best way to kill a child? Um, How quickly are you planning on doing it, and do you care about getting caught? I, I edit see, this, so don't worry about here's it. Here's the thing. <laughs> I think adults like a theme. <laughs> so they, they wait for Halloween. It's like, just you wait, pal. I haven't bought your Christmas present yet, so I'm saving... To be fair, this podcast is the razor blade in the Apple of iTunes, so I think think it's perfectly fine. And so, he he actually gives a lot of information about someone sent this in. I got this story from another source a lot of times. It's like, oh, it was a girl on her wedding night, or a girl getting ready for prom. Not the Halloween episode, but it's like, there's always just subtle changes, and these are like the red flags for him. It's like, I bet this is like, made up. Right. So he tries to go back as far as he can, and usually it's just like, I don't know where the story came from, but there's a really good chance that it's not a true story. Most of the stories that we pass down as folklore do have changed because it is spread word of mouth as opposed right. to where we read it from. It's word of mouth, so there are going to be changes. Friend of a friend, that sort of thing. Or folk. Folk didn't the, pop up? It is. Yeah, okay, yeah, I was I'm, just, okay. I'm just surprised that you knew that. Yeah. <laughs> what can I say? I'm a professor of folklore studies. <laughs> I, I also say foaf. So. And there is one segment here in the Halloween story that he did share, though. Uh, there were these two professors. They found 76 recorded incidents in a 27 year period like in newspapers many of the incidents turned out to be unverifiable or to be hoaxes perpetrated by children in the spirit of halloween misbehavior and no report (laughs) described an incident in which death or serious injury was caused by adulterated goodies i like that i think that that is the exact spirit of halloween uh (laughs) you know calling into newspapers like my candy (laughs) i mean like like, like, what, what kid isn't going to take a little bit of thrill at the thought of you know oh this candy you might be dangerous to me and then go and tell their parents yeah uh, Randy across the street uh, died tonight <laughs> you know like like that is the spirit of Halloween trick-or-treating right there just yeah. don't go ask his mom he uh, he got better <laughs> yeah he got better before you worry about poor old Randy uh-huh. or let me read this one last paragraph there is one case in which a child was killed by contaminated Halloween treats. Mm-hmm. On Halloween in 1974, eight-year-old Timothy O'Brien of Houston, Texas, died from cyanide poisoning after eating a package of Pixie Sticks candy that had been adulterated with the poison. But the person convicted for the murder was not a random sadist, but the boy's father, Ronald Clark O'Brien, who inserted the tainted candy into Timmy's bag after he had returned from trick-or-treating. Oh my god! So kids, if you're listening to this... Um, your parents did it. Run! Just run as fast as you can! Get away from them! If you're in a car listening to this, tuck and roll, tuck and roll! So if your main reason that you won't let your kids trick-or-treat is because the neighbors, look in the mirror, you monster. <laughs> yeah. Hey, this is Vic. I really like your, your defense of razor blades. We did nothing wrong. Can we talk about their ballpoint pen, sir? Uh, I mean, forget the razor blades and the children killing. The ballpoint pen that stops working when it's still full? <laughs> That's a travesty. Well, well we what? just lost our sponsorship. <laughs> I, I don't know. Vic might want the catchphrase, That's a travesty. <laughs> That, that might help them out a lot. I think that would really do a lot. Yeah. That's one of those weird companies, like, they make 
such weird different products. Like, they right. make razor blades and pens. I think of, like, Dove, they make the women's shampoo and chalk. Which one tastes more like the other? <laughs> well, don't don't get the two products confused, though. You know, don't write with a razor blade and don't shave yourself with a pen. I think that's just good luck. Uh, I was going to say, I shower with Dove chocolate every day. <laughs> <laughs> Dogs love me. <laughs> Bryce is filthy, everyone. He looks like Arnold Schwarzenegger at the end of Predator. I look, I does. He's very I look like very Pig Pen from Peanuts. <laughs> Just a dust cloud of Coco. <laughs> Coco Dust Cloud is my new band name. <laughs> There's one last story. This one is called the grocery store scam. Mm. And I'm just going to summarize the story for you here. It's about this girl that goes to a grocery store and there's a woman that keeps following her. Aisle to aisle, just making like weird eye contact with her. And all of a sudden the woman finally realizes she's been caught and she walks over and is like, I'm so sorry. You look just like my daughter who died. Could you just maybe give me a hug? I know it's going to be weird, but it's, and the girl's like, okay, this is weird, but whatever. Like, I feel bad for you. Gives her a hug. The girl ends up trying to go to a checkout line. The woman is, happens to be in the checkout line in front of her. And before this, she's like, hey, you know, when I leave, can you just say, bye, mom? And she's like, okay, yeah, whatever. You know, I just want to get away from you, creepy lady, whatever. The lady puts her stuff on the checkout line. Grocer puts it in bags. And as the lady's leaving, the young lady is like, bye, mom. And she's like, oh, thank you. Goodbye. And the lady puts her stuff on the belt. The bill comes to something a lot larger than what she had thought. She's like, why is my bill so high? The cashier says, oh, your mom said that you were going to cover her bill. And she's like, that's not my mom. (laughs) And so that's where the urban legend ends. This is a story that I love to tell about myself. (laughs) This is an urban legend that I claim to be my own. And I tell people... Bryce likes to make people pay for his groceries. (laughs) I'll ask asking strangers to say, bye, Bryce, bye, mom. No, but like... Would you please call me mom? (laughs) Uh, no, sir. (laughs) It's so funny, like, the story, like, I tell is, like, oh, go out to, like, one of my friends, like, so despised, like, man, you wouldn't believe what happened to me at Walmart today. And I tell the story about, like, some lady walked up to me and said, oh, like, her dead son. And I'm like, okay, bye, mom. And she's like, bye, son. Turned into a joke because it, the story continues then is that right. the person runs out to the car and as the lady is, like, tries to, like, throw all her stuff in the car, she gets into the car just as the young lady reaches in and grabs her leg. I'm pulling her leg and I'm pulling her leg just like I'm pulling your leg right now. Right. <laughs> and you, you've done it to me before. I, yeah, I you could have got that story. story. Yeah. <laughs> And I, I read that story in here. I was like, oh, "This is me. This. I'm guilty of this. It's hilarious." Well, I think I think I think the two defining characteristics of an urban legend: number one is it changes as it spreads, right. and two, falsely saying either it happened to you or it happened to somebody near you. Right now, the difference with yours is you're doing it as a joke, and the people yeah. know it's a joke. Eventually, yeah. Especially like going back to the Foaf, the yeah. friend of a friend. Yeah. A lot of these stories never come from direct, hey, yeah. I saw this happen directly. Mm. I am the source you need to go to. It's always my sister's best friend's cousin Nancy, her boyfriend's <laughs> brother's cousin Fred. Karate teachers, veterinarians. <laughs> <laughs> he saw this happen. I couldn't believe it. Or I clicked on a link on Facebook. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what is interesting, though, is that this book was published in 1989, mm. so it wasn't the big dot com craze hadn't happened yet the urban legends that we get from email aren't around yet so it'd be interesting to see what kind of more modern urban legends he's received like the creating your facebook status as facebook you're not allowed to use my photos oh my <laughs> this is a, le- a legal document because it's my or, status or sovereign citizenry you can spread these a lot quicker nowadays and what's kind of scary about that too is that you can create Photoshop images that look That's true, so yeah, yeah, real. Oh yeah, we saw the bog monster of this town, and like here's a photo of it. But there are people who are also doing these to show how easy it is to fool people too. Yeah, there's one guy on YouTube who did, you know, Nazi UFOs and uh, Air Force One plane crash, and made them as real as he could just to show, hey, mm-hmm. here's what's possible. Don't be fooled by this stuff. No, I made it's, these. It's the whole you eat eight spiders in your lifetime in your sleep. That prove that, me wrong. That. <laughs> That started by a professor that wanted to prove that lies were so easily spread online that they're taken as truth that she just, she came up with that Uh idea that you eat eight spiders in your lifetime. Worked out really well for her, didn't it? She choked on a spider and died. Oh, (laughs) really? No, I have no idea. (laughs) See how easy it is? (laughs) This is why you never trust Sam. You're the reason these stories spread, (laughs) JC. Um, Wouldn't it be great to discover that you started an urban legend? 
you can't. like you told somebody one thing one time and it just spread. And you're like, wait, wait a second, what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, like you said, these are part of our folklore. So well, yeah, yeah, yeah. They serve a function, you know. That is true. Mostly cautionary tales, I would say, for the most part, of things not yeah. to do. Mm-hmm. The title here, "Curses Broiled Again," like the very first story in the book is either a girl going to prom or going for her wedding, mm-hmm. and she goes tanning, and instead of doing the recommended like five to fifteen minutes, she's like, "Oh, I'll just add a little extra time on." To right. it, because I deserve it. Um, <laughs> and what it turns out is that she cooked her organs, and she's slowly done, uh, and she's in a hospital upstate now uh, on her deathbed. And well, you said this was in 1989. That's <laughs> she's been there a while. It's, just, it's a slow cook. The she's prognosis not even a fresh is chicken anymore. Like. <laughs> It's something stupid, something interesting that nobody should do, basically. And here's the reasons why, is is most urban legends. Or it's a ghost story, I would say, Hmm. would be the other ones. Like the the hook hand guy, you know? Oh, yeah. And all that was left was a hook on the door handle, you know? That's a great story. Like, do you know how much prosthetics cost? That guy would not leave that on your car. And all that was left was a prosthetic foot. (laughs) Worth thousands of dollars. A good half of those stories are things you shouldn't do, and the other half were just scary stories. Right. right? Or the, the woman who eats a, a bit of undercooked octopus and discovers the, later on that it, there's a fully grown octopus growing inside of her body. Um, <laughs> they could have just gone for tetrodotoxin. Oh, so of like... Of course. You know, <laughs> uh, yes, tetronotoxin, my favorite dinosaur. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's in like blowfish and I think some form of oh, okay. If you eat undercooked sushi, you dead. Right. That, it's... Very you good. dead. I like that yeah. you used a big word and then said you dead. It's That's a very good prognosis. He's people. a doctor, folks. <laughs> you dead. <laughs> please, please incorporate that into your bedside manner. <laughs> So that's my book. Best Urban Legend? Oh, yeah. What's your favorite? Hmm. This is the one I, I didn't share. This is an email that the professor got. Dear professor, this was told to me by a guy from Connecticut. A man was driving home late one evening going south on I-91. He had taken several drinks earlier, and this was so obvious that he was soon pulled over. As the state cop approached the car, an accident occurred on the northbound lane. So the cop told him to get out of the car and wait. The cop crossed the meeting to see if he could be of any help. The drunk waited a while and then decided to heck with it. He hopped into the car and took off home. There he told his wife to tell the police if they should call that he had been home all night and sober as a judge. The next morning the doorbell rang and when he answered it there were two state policemen there including the one who had stopped him. Naturally he claimed that he had been home all night. Just ask my wife. His wife backed up the story, but the cop asked him if they could look in the garage. The man, not sure what was going on, said, sure. And when they opened the garage, there was the police cruiser, its lights (laughs) still flashing. (laughs) (laughs) Delightful. Oh, anything you did not like about this book? No, it was actually really nice, just like two or three pages at most right. for each story. So he, he was able to put them in concise categories like that. It was part of the automobile section. There was like myths and legends. There was stories about pets, college stories, which one of them was if your roommate commits suicide, you as the roommate get a 4.0 for the semester. I've heard about that one, yeah. That- I had four roommates in college. How are we going to you know, kill our roommate so that we could make it look like a suicide so we could get a 4.0? It turns out none of these colleges that he's ever talked to have this policy. So, uh, Phil and Bud, if you're listening, it's a good thing we, we did not kill Dan. Uh, Uh, JC, you're a pretty literary fellow. I'd say you're more literally than Bryce and me combined, so I'm very happy to hear about what you read this month. Okay, so uh, I read When Breath Becomes Air by the late Paul Kalanithi. Oh. <laughs> but no, so Paul Kalanithi was almost a neurosurgeon. He was 36 years old in his final year of neurosurgery residency when he ended up with these really weird symptoms, persistent cough, excruciating back pain, weight loss. By this point, fellow medical students, you should be sinking <laughs> cancer. And if you are not sinking that, I recommend you go study before you take the board. <laughs> so, you know, he went and got this followed up on and he had stage four lung cancer, bone metastases. Within two years, he was dead. 
I'm assuming he wrote this book before that happened, I'm guessing. During? Oh, um, oh um, my goodness. Yes. Listen, when you're on your deathbed, you got nothing else to do except write a book. <laughs> that, that's what his wife says. You know, during his final months, they were mm-hmm. giving him stimulants. They were making sure to avoid neurotoxic agents so that he could continue writing. As you can guess by the fact that he was an aspiring neurosurgeon, this man was incredibly goal-driven. Mm-hmm. Um, and during the last years of his life, his goal was to finish writing this book. Very, very interesting character. He never thought he was going to be a doctor. He wanted to be a literary person because he was obsessed with... And he was right. (laughs) (laughs) Goals. Just just saying, the goal-driven man, he did it. He did succeed. He did succeed. He ended up going into medicine because he was obsessed with this question of what is life? How do we ascribe it meaning? You know, what is death? And after reading all of the great literary people, he decided, I need to experience this. I need to see people passing from life into death. I need to see them making decisions about what gives their life meaning. Hmm. There was also quite a bit of altruism. His wife talks about that more than he does. She does the prologue and, and she highlights a different version of the man because the man in the book was very reflective. He was heading towards the grave. Understandable, yeah. yeah that things were metaphysical for him. So that's a lot of what this book is about. Is It's about him taking this question that was at first theoretical and then was experienced through the second and third person with his patients and then, you know, just crashed in on him and became his own personal experience. So what does he have to say about it? What are his conclusions? Um, one that's probably of particular interest to you guys and our listeners. Um, <laughs> is that, uh, are you listening? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> um, is that he ended up coming back to Christianity hmm. because he said he used to be ironclad atheist, I believe was his phrase, because, you know, quite frankly, you do the math and... You don't really need God to explain most things. It's just a deeply unsatisfying version of things. Particularly yeah. towards the end where questions of probability become less important. You right, know, right, right. He went back to a faith that he found gave him meaning. Do you think it was more of a deathbed salvation sort of thing in that he knew the end was near so he might as well put all his cards in order? Was that it? Or did he actually still come at it from a rational point and then come to the conclusion that Christianity was the answer, not atheism? I think rational is too strong a word. Um, One of the wonderful things about science is everything has a p-value. It's all based on probabilities. So the thing was... Not urine. I uh, I was kind of wondering. (laughs) How many bags of urine is this? Maybe three urines. You need to listen to the urologist, Sam. <laughs> the urologist coming this fall to ABC. <laughs> Things that will never make Streaming it on Streaming now. Streaming now. <laughs> oh, oh, well done. P value, private eye. <laughs> You're in trouble. <laughs> Theme song by Urethra Franklin. <laughs> They solve every crime with, with random drug testing. <laughs> it's not a job for people who are yellow. <laughs> <laughs> P value. Shining hour. So I don't think he ever ruled it out. I think he just concluded the probability was much higher that it wasn't true. So why worry about it? But like I said, priorities shift when you're coming towards death. Mm -hmm. Um, And that was one of the things his oncologist kept telling him, you need to figure out your values. You need to figure out your values. So I think his values shifted. Um, His oncologist was very well practiced, came universally recommended by most of his colleagues. And one of the interesting things was she actually told him no when he wanted something. He wanted something called the Kaplan-Meier curve, which is how you predict how long you're going to live. Uh, I can see why you wouldn't want to give that to a patient. Well, she, she just said flat out no. And I mean, then he was like, well, fine, I'm a doctor. I'm going to go look them up. Problem was, he couldn't figure out where he lied on that curve, which was the thing, because she... Well, honey, I either have three days or 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Not exactly, but it was like, well... Most patients live about two years, but some go as far as 10, uh-huh. and right. some people die, you know, within a week. The last thing she told him before he precipitously declined a couple months later was, you have five good years. She never gave him a definite diagnosis before, mm-hmm. but he kept huh. pressing and pressing and pressing because, like I said, gold driven man. He said, you know, if I have 10 years, I'm going back to the OR to be a neurosurgeon. Right. If I have a year, I'm going to write. If I have six months, I'm going to spend it all with my wife. Was that her common practice for every patient? I would assume so. Wow. Sure, it, it would change what you're going to do, like you were saying, but at the same time, I, I do feel like knowing when you're going to die, it seems like... I think it was left impacting and more of a strong humility about her ability to predict. Because that's so the, she just wasn't good at her job. That's <laughs> fine. That's, exactly. that's what I've often thought. It's like, you know, the doctor gave grandma two weeks. She's been alive for three months. I think doctors are just bad at estimating. <laughs> and <laughs> not that grandma's doing better than <laughs> I mean, that's the problem. You look it's at it's these not a curves. miracle. It's you're bad at your job. That's the thing, though. You look at these curves, and there's probabilities. 
what is the impact if you're wrong mm -hmm. about that probability? The great majority of people fit here, but I mean, you've got a 10, 15% chance of being on one of the outskirts or something. Is it, right. Does it look like a bell curve? It's more of a plateau, usually with a steep drop off when okay. everybody starts croaking, and then oh. it gets... And then it comes back up? What? No, 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 oh, okay. it never goes back up. <laughs> because these are survival curves. So you start at 100, yeah. it drops off relatively slowly, you hit a precipitous decline, right. and then you see the last few peter out to zero. I think she just decided with the amount of people on those bell curves and with the impact my pronouncements have right. on their lives, it's not worth it. Obviously, at the end, Dr. Kalanithi prevailed upon her. Her answer was wrong. And mm -hmm. I think that's why she how, didn't how, give it. How far off was her? About five years. Okay. I had heard a few years ago on This American Life, don't rate them on iTunes, <laughs> rate us. Um, they, they, there was a story. Pirate of, them. <laughs> <laughs> there was a story on This American Life where this lady took her grandmother to oncologist, cancer doctors. Instead of giving the grandmother the result, they gave it to the young lady. And it turns out, yes, indeed, grandma had cancer. But instead of telling her, they said, oh, you're fine. You're cancer free. Because they felt that in her old age, she was like in like her late 80s. So it's like she could go any day now and grandma lived 10 more years or so and they never told her and who knows and if she would have how much longer she exactly would have, like, it's, it's really it. like goodness. mind over matter like how much does our ability to take into account our morbidity and how does that have an effect on our health well, most of the research has actually shown that by giving patients a more accurate estimate of what their disease is, instead of being overly optimistic, they're better able to cope with anxiety, they're better able to hmm. plan things, they actually do better. As soon as you said that, I was just thinking, wow, what a lawsuit. Uh, <laughs> well, yeah, exactly. That's yeah. what I was thinking, too. I mean, yeah. Well, the, the young lady told the rest of her family. Yeah. Uh -huh. I think, like, maybe her grandfather was still alive, and they told him, yeah. and he's like, yeah, you can't tell her. Okay. It makes me wonder how much longer would she have lived with cancer treatment? Right. Like, what killed her makes me... Well, like, that's... Right. It depends on the cancer. Like, we stop screening for certain cancers at certain ages because by then, you're going to die with it, not die from it. We lay off doing prostate screening at a certain time because, yeah, maybe you're going to have prostate cancer at 90, but quite frankly, we aren't going to operate because you're going to die of smoking or something first. I had just watched an episode of Adam Ruins Everything on True TV, <laughs> and he, he had covered hospitals and stuff like that and he was talking about mammograms for those who don't know what those are don't look them up it's a, a it's a high pressure breast exam <laughs> yeah yeah and so what they found was that with mammograms they aren't as accurate and as helpful as they have previously because if there is cancer it can't determine what level of severity that cancer is and there's certain cancers that like jc said like you'll die before it can do anything to you, even if like you're a 20 year old hmm. or something like that. Like some cancers that are so slow, there's some that are so fast that the mammogram won't even catch it because it's already moved past. Um, and then there's some cancers that like, yeah, it's in there, but it's just gonna stay dormant. It's not really gonna do anything to you. And then there are the bad cancers that people actually need to get surgery on. But the problem is that these mammograms are unable to determine what one of these like four different types of cancers it can be. And so hmm. I think it was really interesting that I don't really look into mammographal technology or whatever we mean. Mammographal. <laughs> Marvelous. Um, what, what is out there for women, and, and men get breast cancer too, so what's out there for those who do have breast cancer, other than getting a mammogram? It's interesting to have that out in the open, that these aren't as good as what we thought, and so maybe there's researchers out there that can find better ways of determining of those different types of cancers, which is one we can leave alone, which is one that we should be more concerned about. I, I think that was the, the big point Jimmy Stewart made in, in my favorite Jimmy Stewart movie, It's a Mammographal Life. <laughs> 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 there was one thing uh, you had mentioned he was a neuroscientist working at a hospital myself <laughs> I was over listening to a conversation that one of our neuroscientists was having and he had a 3D printed model of a brain with like different like oh. uh, neuro pathways and stuff like lit up in different types of the plastic and so like you could see like neurons and stuff going this way and a different pathway in a different color this way That's uh, neat. and it was actually two thirds the size of about a human brain or so and there was a big yellow chunk in the middle and so he was saying this yellow chunk is the tumor mm -hmm. and I was like oh is this like a model that you show patients no this is someone's MRI that we took put it in a 3D printer wow Oh, we 3D cool. printed their brain. Oh. And uh, it was like, oh, that's so cool. They're trying to get funding for this project to give patients a 3D model of their individual brain to show them this is where your brain tumor is. This is why we need to go at this angle so that we can avoid these oh. different colored. It's so neat. You can hold a model of your brain. It's more than just looking at a like an x-ray on a, a white screen or looking at MRIs on a computer, which you don't really understand as just a, your average human being, but you can hold a model of your brain to see, oh, there's a big chunk that shouldn't be there. 
we've barely talked about your book. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> so this is great. Was there, was there, this uh, is well, great. No, I think, I think most of this stuff is pretty good, but was there anything in this book that you found difficult or challenging? Um, was it just a fun read for you? No, um, honestly, <laughs> because he's medical, I'm medical, he's going into neuroscience because, you know, he wants to understand death and stuff. I'm going into psychiatry because I want to help people there. So a lot of the times I was comparing and contrasting myself with him. Okay. One of the reasons he says he wrote the book was to kind of map out what death is like for people who would follow into it. And I was thinking to myself, what would it be like if I was experiencing death, particularly at the stage of life he did? Because I'll be honest, death in some ways terrifies me. I'm not sure why. You're not sure why? We, I, I'm not sure but, why. But this is a Halloween special. If there's one thing Ooh. Halloween is... <laughs> yeah. If there's one thing Halloween's about, it's death. Yeah, but like uh -huh. the times I've, you know, been very close to death, uh -huh. it's been very scary, and I'm not sure why. I mean, some of it's uh -huh. probably animal instinct. I think some of it is that right now I'm a terrible value proposition. Like, that would be the most frustrating thing. If I were to die just as I was about to complete residency, uh -huh. I haven't even had a chance to be useful. I'm simply, you know, a quarter million dollar waste hey, of education. Hey, you are a guest on a podcast. Thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, know, you. Your voice will exist forever set. until iTunes pulls us down. <laughs> <laughs> Which... That's one of the things I was thinking about. It's like, he owes the medical school so much money. It's wiped out on death. It's wiped out on death. Is it? Is it? Oh, I've oh, looked this okay. up. I've oh. looked this up. because Just another reason to, to kill your roommate. Well, they, <laughs> <laughs> the thing is, they always tell you, you know, have a parallel plan. Have a plan B in case you don't get into what you want. Is mine has death? always... No, mine has been fake my own death and move to the condo because they have a non-extradition duty with the USA. Um... <laughs> So, I mean, that was part of it. So, thinking mm -hmm. about what death would be like for him. And then the other thing is, like I said, from a utilitarian standpoint, he did fantastic. From a more personal standpoint, his cancer was one of the best things that ever happened to him. Because he and his wife were deeply in love. They met and got married right after med school. She was an internist. An internist. Uh, so she only an intern. works on interns? And, yeah. and <laughs> pretty much. I can't yeah. afford this. I'll, don't worry. I'm a specialist. <laughs> but uh, internal medicine, general oh, okay. hospitalist. Okay. A week or so before he confessed to her that he had cancer because he was working through the diagnosis, she said, I need to leave. We need some time apart. We need to honestly reevaluate our marriage. Um, and it wasn't because they didn't love each other. It's mm -hmm. because this guy had been working 100 hour weeks oh, yeah. for years Two, two medical professionals aren't going to have too much of a marriage at that stage of their lives, I'm sure. <laughs> Amy, I love you. Fingers crossed. Um, so, um, and then the other thing is, like, he's also... We'd like to dedicate this episode to Amy, <laughs> with JC, and we're not sure. And our <laughs> <laughs> They were a very honest couple. Apparently, Paul used to keep a gorilla suit in his trunk at all times in case of emergencies. Uh, you would have liked him. Gorilla uh, emergencies. Exactly. <laughs> Daily at a hospital. But then the other thing is he's talking about, you know, how he went through med school and he saw a bunch of his friends, you know, change their minds from neurosurgery because of the time, the rigor. And right. then he saw other people were a little bit of an Icarus. And he said, you know, the one became a tax evaluator and then a bunch of them committed suicide. Just huh. a very broken system that right. he was in many ways lucky to make it through even to this point so as someone heading into that system and as a public health person who's always thinking you know can we fix the system oh well, you know neuroscience it's not like it's brain surgery i mean <laughs> you put something here you put something here you stir um, yeah. <laughs> you need a nice eggy consistency if you're going to get the right case. listen if phineas gage can do it with a pipe just bursting through his head you know anyone can phineas gage was mm. is it 1800s real world worker yep he was drilling the holes into the ground that they then pack dynamite in, they blow them out, and they can move the railroad forward. Phineas Gage is packing the dynamite down with a metal pole, ignites the dynamite, the pole shoots. Listeners, if you go ahead, touch your chin, <laughs> right underneath your chin, it goes through there, goes behind his eyes, and out through what's called your prefrontal cortex, which is just like your forehead, and it shoots out the top. Everyone's like, oh my gosh, Phineas Gage is going to die. And he's like, actually, I'm okay. <laughs> um, so he Didn't picks up the pole, speech. which he keeps the rest of his life, by the way. <laughs> he keeps the pole with him. He walks home. Uh -huh. They stitch him up. So Phineas Gage eventually stops showing up to work. He stops providing for his family. He starts spending more time at the bar mm -hmm. and spending more time just becoming an alcoholic. And he just becomes this individual that doesn't make long-term life decisions. And what they were able to find out, the prefrontal cortex helps control long-term decisions. Like, oh, oh I, okay. need to go, I need to wake up today so that I can go to work so that I can pay for my house, pay for bills and stuff mm -hmm. like that. I have to make these decisions that are against what I want. Right. And so without that ability to make those connections in his brain because a pipe burst through it, he doesn't 
doesn't make that connection, then all he goes after is just his desires. Very interesting. That's how we found out a lot about neuroscience. Terrible accidents. Um, <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, is this a book you would recommend? I'd recommend it to just about anybody, really, because, as they say in the book, and as, dear listeners, you probably already know, we all gonna die. Um... <laughs> <laughs> So, since we're doing a Halloween episode, I must confess, a good half of the books I own probably would apply just <laughs> fine to this. I actually want to give you guys the option. It's an old Halloween question. Trick or treat? Ooh. Yeah, let's go trick. Trick? Okay, well, the trick is I brought two books. They are well-loved. Oh, yes. These, these are two very old children's books about movie monsters. One is How to Care for Your Monster by Norm, and I cannot read his last name because the it's, it's just covered up in pen. This book's in terrible <laughs> shape. Uh, Norman Bridwell. Uh, the other one is Movie Monsters, uh, Monster Makeup, and Monster Shows to Put On by Alan Ormsby. And these are two, as JC pointed out, two very well-loved books. I've owned them both for a long time. I've owned them so long, in fact, that you can see where I have colored in some of the pictures oh. with colored pencils oh. uh, very badly. Um, these are two books from my childhood that were that were very formative books for me. One is How to Care for Your Monster, which is basically a kid's book, which is all about owning monsters like Frankenstein's monster, Dracula, Werewolf, hmm. and the Mummy. And it's all about the foibles of owning and taking care of these monsters. Uh, and it, it's really just a fun, silly book. It doesn't really have a lot of depth to it, and the illustrations are kind of fun. Uh, But what's kind of surprising about it is it's kind of grotesque, too. Hmm. Like, for a kid's book, there are certain images that really just kind of stick out. Like, here's an illustration of somebody's mom having to sew up Frankenstein monster's stitches. And it's not not a a gory picture, but there is something kind of unsettling about seeing somebody stitch up another person while they're moving around. The book ends with putting on a a pet show of monsters, uh, and it kind of jokes about the the best prize you can give the werewolf is the judge to eat. And it's it's, it's got this weird kind of... (laughs) Yeah, it's it's got this kind of silly, macabre sense of humor for children, which is kind of what Halloween is all about. Right. It's basically death for kids. Um, That's... (laughs) It is. I mean, yeah, it's, Halloween it's is death for kids, basically. It's it's all about, you know, celebrating mm-hmm. the dying of the earth in the autumn, looking at lost loved ones, ways of dying, and then people wearing costumes to scare evil spirits away. I mean, there, there's a, a lot of dark underpinnings to, to Halloween. I thought it'd be kind of fun to look at some of the, the dark underpinnings of my childhood with these scary books. <laughs> uh, the other one is Movie Monsters, which is pretty straightforward. It is just a book all about movie monsters. And by the way... For those of you wondering at home, uh, where are the spies in these two books? <laughs> well, uh, one of the movie monsters that's covered is Dracula. They cover the Bela Lugosi Dracula. They also cover the Christopher Lee Dracula. Mm. And as we all know, Christopher Lee was in the no, SOE, British spy. Yeah, British spy in World War II. Yes. So it covers World War II and spies this time around. So I, nice. I just, I'm surrounded by spies every single book. I can't help it. These are two books that were very much a part of my childhood. I've owned them for a long time. In fact, one of these I actually lost in a house fire. But hmm. I found it at a book and I thought, you know what? This is a bit of my childhood. I want to own this again. So I picked up another copy Aww. of it. Like th- These books are fairly kid-friendly, mm-hmm. but they're covering a dark subject being horror movies. It kind of seems like kids' fiction has a, a fair amount of darkness we were talking about earlier. Mm-hmm. What do you guys think about having darker subjects in kids' fiction? It, I don't want to say it roughs them up, but I mean, it kind of like prepares them maybe a little okay. bit more for the world. Is like, you know, the world's a tough place. and like, Not everything can be, you know as happy in a kid's television show. Mm. So I think in one sense it is scary, but I mean, it prepares them for... Uh, it, it reminded me of thinking of that R.L. Stein, the guy who wrote yeah, Goosebumps. Goosebumps, yeah. He had said that he never wanted to have things like divorce or drug use mm. as a plot line. Because they're too scary? Well, no, because he wanted oh. to prove that there are scary things that are outside of this world that we can get scared of and, and enjoy that oh, because okay, we yeah. know it's not real. I think you're hitting on a good point there is enjoy that. Right. I think that is the difference between, I'd say, an unpleasant horror and, M.R. James' good phrase, a pleasing terror. It's fun scary as opposed to a generally horrifying scary. Mm -hmm. I enjoy these books partly because they were, they're talking about movies that I wasn't allowed to watch because my parents knew if I watched them, I wouldn't be sleeping. (laughs) Uh, And if I wasn't sleeping, I'd be keeping them up because they would have been too scary for me Hmm. as opposed to a more banal, a more charming, a more funny kind of scary, which these books kind of give. Yeah. How about you, man? What do you think about 
the the place of, of scariness in kids' literature. Well, I mean, I think scariness is playful. It can, it can mm-hmm. be playful. It can be good, like you said, outwardly. But, I mean, as far as darker scenes in general, I feel like we definitely need to be mindful about how we incorporate those, mm-hmm. simply because a lot of us inhabit very different realities okay. these days. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. We used to have a shared reality, you know? You get the Black Plague, you die at 20, and, you know, that's life. It was great. Those were the um, days. Exactly. Um, so we were very familiar. The 1970s were a very different time. Right. <laughs> we were very familiar with, you know, the vocabulary of death. It was something right. that was present. It was something that just about everybody yeah. had experienced. These days, I mean, we're terrified of death, particularly as a Western culture. We like to pretend that we're never going to die. Mm. We've pushed our age of living up, and uh, we've also created massive class segmentation where some of us will go quite some time with very little traumatic happening. And then there are those of us who grow up with, you know, like you said, Mm -hmm. drug addiction and divorce and even death, you know. So I think mindfulness of the audience, but some of those books are crucial in helping kids navigate a landscape that because we're a fractured culture and we don't really have a solid understanding of how to negotiate these actually scary Mm -hmm. topics, Mm -hmm. those are very important books. To help people cope with that. Okay. And I think, I think a good example of that was honestly our last segment. I mean, we laughed at cancer a lot. <laughs> uh, right. You know, I mean, we, we poke fun at it because it is genuinely scary because it is tragic. I'm mm-hmm. sure all of us know somebody who had cancer in that form. I think that the, the combination of humor and horror is so natural, uh, it's kind of easy for us to, to kind of take away its facts yeah. a bit while still making it scary. But it, it makes me kind of wonder what, what do you guys think the line is when it comes to scariness? When it comes to kids' fiction. Well, that's what I wanted to mention. I think children's authors especially have a harder time of writing horror than for an adult. Mm. Because if you're writing a story for an adult, you can make it as scary as you want. Because mm. adults know it's not gonna, it's not real. Like the, you know, the Frankenstein's not gonna come and get that. Or Frankenstein's monster, rather. I'm sorry. <laughs> Literature buffs. Uh, <laughs> Good catch. Good catch. Kevin, I believe was his name. <laughs> Kevin. <laughs> <laughs> no, Kevin, back, back, Kevin, back. Um, <laughs> it's a lot. Daryl Dracula. Yeah. <laughs> like when you're writing for kids, I think you know the author may have to take into account. Oh, I can't make it that scary mm-hmm. um, because I'm going for a particular audience. I don't want to scare them too much that they're not going to come back and buy my books. Like going back to like R.L. Stein, like he tried to avoid certain real life scary things I think he wanted to avoid that altogether so that way they had an escape that was still scary even though there may be certain aspects of their own life that are scary as an adult writing for other adults you can write about the scariness of addiction or whatever you want to write about but with kids I think it's probably harder because you have to come up with different ways of scaring them you can't scare them too much yes yes and 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 no at the same time though I do think that hopefully it's easier to scare children than it is adults Mm-hmm. You know, hopefully. Yeah. Not not saying that's necessarily true, but I do think that in a kid's book, you should hopefully be able to scare them with less than you would right. when you would need to. I mean, I've, I've read a fair amount of both effectively children's horror literature. I'm a big fan of John Belair's. And I think the Harry Potter books certainly delve into ju- juvenile horror. I mean, mm-hmm. the, I mean the, the big the big bad guy is an undead man, effectively, who just kind of floats around in spirit form until one of the later books he comes back to life, basically, and starts a war against the main character. I mean, the, the first book has somebody drinking the blood of a unicorn right in front of Harry. Yeah. You know, there, there's a lot of horrific imagery in these books. Is there anything that is inherently damaging about it? I mean, there might be, if you don't have it down to the child's level. I mean, like, it could really scare them. I mean, I'm not sure if it's long-lasting. I haven't looked at studies. I should. Yeah, prepare next time. Exactly. Come on. Come on. Come on. Exactly. I feel like I can't speak when I don't have any literature backing it. But I mean, like, especially where the horror is conquered, Uh like... That's an adrenaline rush, and I think it shows kids, hey, you can beat this out. Like, yeah, I, th- I think that. Yeah, I think that's a really good distinction. Is quite often in these horror books, for kids, for the most part, the evil goes away. Mm-hmm. You can have a very different ending in an adult book. Evil tends to win, or the evil doesn't tend to matter because nothing matters in the end in a horror book. I think it's Neil Gaiman who says, "Fantasy doesn't teach kids that dragons exist. It teaches them that they yeah. can slay dragons." I'm not a huge Neil Gaiman fan, but that's that's pretty good. Mm-hmm. Cool. Yeah. I think I think that's a key thing to remember. <laughs> is when it comes to something that is scary, if in the end the kid wins, if in the end the evil is vanquished, effectively it isn't horror, it becomes fantasy. The last scary, like not existentially terrifying thing, like Brave right. New World or something right, like right, that. Right. I played Bioshock at, you know, like... Oh, okay, yeah, 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 yeah. When, you know, the lights are off in the room, it's past your bedtime, and you're creeping through, and everything's jumping out at you, and, and you're immersed. It's just traditionally scary. 
but like even though there's horrible things in it, at the end you can win, and you know after you made it out of all of the monsters chasing after you, and you've got the <laughs> adrenaline, to, and you're like, I made it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> And that, that's part of the reason why you read horror stories and ghost stories and so on, is there is something fun about being just scared enough. Mm-hmm. I recently started watching a horror movie on Netflix that I wanted to see. I'm watching it in half-hour chunks, uh, <laughs> because by the 20-minute mark of my chunks, I start getting really uncomfortable mm-hmm. and really terrified and just not wanting to continue. When it comes to horror movies, I'm a complete lightweight. I, I have absolutely no backbone. But there is something thrilling about being able to enjoy a victory and being able to to get past the terror yeah yeah that's the way i was with the shining the first time i saw it. i need to watch that it took me like four yeah. hours because <laughs> i keep pa- it was like in the middle of the day yeah so i didn't do it at night um i would just pause it like every half hour i was like oh i'll see if there's any laundry <laughs> I need to do mom it. do you need help with anything <laughs> repaint the kitchen okay <laughs> i do think it's interesting like for me personally like i didn't read children's horror books as a child Mm -hmm. I didn't still don't pay money to go to a movie theater to see a scary movie Mm -hmm. I think that's stupid (laughs) Um, paying money is for jerks (laughs) let's pirate everything sneak in the back (laughs) get a job at the theater you get to watch them all free (laughs) snag someone's popcorn when they put it in the side seat (laughs) that's right shove a kid down the stairs take his seat yeah (laughs) get out of here kid Um, I'm watching Frozen (laughs) Scariest movie ever. Frozen. <laughs> Let it go, Bryce. Okay. <laughs> like, honestly, Wait, uh, a lot of them are like, look, I have no desire to see Saw because it doesn't strike me as Saw. See Saw? Yeah. <laughs> he has no desire for it, Sam. Aren't you listening? It scares him. Well, I mean, that's the thing. It doesn't strike me as scary. Fulcrums! Oh! <laughs> it's just gross. It's like... You're cutting people up and they're well, yeah, cutting I, me. It's I, like, you. I cannot stand gore. And that is, I think, my biggest... My gore, biggest gore problem. horror. Go, yeah, I, I can't. Or do you mean the it. vice president under uh, Clinton? <laughs> yes, under I cannot chest. stand Al Gore. He's terrifying. <laughs> you leave him alone. <laughs> He's doing his best. <laughs> <laughs> because I cannot stand Gore, I can enjoy reading a book, but seeing it on the, on the screen, I think, is, is too hard for me and too mm-hmm. too terrifying and too uncomfortable. I think that's that's where the real line goes. How are you on Gore, Mr. Med Student? Uh, you know, I. Could tell you some things, but it might lose listeners. Like, honestly, real-life gore, I've got no problem with. Uh-huh. I've seen some stuff. I haven't seen as much stuff as other people, but I've seen some pretty pretty serious stuff. How, how about gore in a horror movie? It's gratuitous. Okay. It's, it's like, here is human pain, not to advance the plot, not for any particular reason. It's here for Set pain's dressing. sake. It's, it dressing. seems like sadism. Mm-hmm. Sure. I will say I actually found myself wishing there was more gore. Uh, I went to see Wonder Woman. Oh, uh, okay. I know it was a superhero movie. But, but, but World War One. Exactly. I right. was like, this needs to be more brutal. <laughs> <laughs> what I think is interesting is that there's actually like a whole like community of actors that are like missing arms, missing legs, yeah, stuff yeah, like yeah. that. And they're hired out for like these war movies and stuff like that. Uh-huh. And so they get a prosthetic on and that's what the actor cuts off. And then they're like, ah! <laughs> they start screaming on there like, yeah, I've lost a leg in Saber Pirate Ryan. lost a leg in uh, Wind Talkers. Uh, well, that's not that I lost my arm in uh, Steel Magnolias. <laughs> Pretty funny. I was the head in the box. Every French Revolution movie, that was me. <laughs> I'm a professional guillotine stuntman. <laughs> I have an incredibly small head and a really <laughs> thick neck. A really thick neck. <laughs> the blades can't get through. <laughs> I'd like to thank our special guest, JC. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for giving us your uh, intellectual medical side. Thanks for having me. And your ridiculous, goofy side. We, oh, we, yeah. we, enjoy, oh, well. we enjoy all facets of you. Second guys. hand. Appreciate it. Uh, yeah. Appreciate Sam, did you know that we have an online presence? Not really. Yeah. Where, where, where could I possibly go to find out more about well, me? I don't know how listeners are listening to this specific podcast, mm. whether they're on SoundCloud.com, looking at Book Reports podcast on there, or if they're on iTunes, Oh, which is great because you can download it onto electronic device, take it to a funeral and listen to it there. Uh, if you'd like. Well, I even heard or, they could rate you on iTunes. They, oh, they possi- oh, wouldn't that be nice? You know, rate us or rate us a review? That'd be wonderful. Oh. And that actually helps us get higher on iTunes. And here's the thing. I've realized that we've gone through all the stages of grief. We, we've really gone through a lot of bargaining. Like, please rate us on <laughs> iTunes. I'm eventually going to get to anger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm in <It's>, denial. <laughs> Don't do it. Yeah. <laughs> For this episode, I'm just going to go to bargaining. Please, please rate us on iTunes. Just... We have nothing else. <laughs> Please. <laughs>
Um, so I'm an acceptance. <laughs> Leave me alone, you bunch of illiterate. You don't like us. <laughs> I'm accepted. <laughs> Find us on iTunes. One of our followers on SoundCloud, I love their name so much, Rockasaurus Rex. Thanks wow. thanks for listening. Oh. <laughs> what a great name. Every time they like one of our episodes, I, I get a little smile. Our email address is bookreportspodcast at gmail.com. If you enjoy what Sam is doing and think, man, I could use a, a bit more Sam in my life, go to skullduggeryinthesmoke.blogspot.com. Is there anything that you're working on this month? Still working on the guide to Constantinople in the 1850s. I've moved into some of the different ethnic people that live in Constantinople at that time, our Armenians, Greeks, and so on, uh, looking at the religions now, too. Interesting. Wow. Just reminding the listeners, this is for like gameplay. This is it, it's it's mostly designed for role playing games. If you want to okay. set it there, but it's also just a good guide of actual facts. JC, do you have anything you're currently working on that people might be interested in? We're probably going to try and do a baseline demographic survey, the Amish health status in the region. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That yeah. Sounds so interesting. Cool. For all our Amish listeners, <laughs> how did you get this podcast? <laughs> Please rate us on iTunes. <laughs> yes. How are you going to go about doing that? And like, what's what's the methodology for that? Well. Williamsport Regional now uh Anyways, um, so they've got a long-term relationship with a lot of Amish patients. Guy Singer has a few. I'm going to hopefully be working with a few docs there during my MPH thing. We'll pull our connections. We'll hmm. hand out surveys. And the idea is that if we get a baseline demographic health status, then we'll actually be able to determine are the interventions we're doing actually helpful? Wow. Or are they hurting, maybe? That's interesting. Yeah. Um, we've been working with them on some, like, burn care and stuff. Some of their traditional methods actually seem like they might hold promise even for our system. Hmm. Wow. And then a lot of it is just, like, how can we better facilitate the relationship between the Amish and the English right. healthcare system? Huh. That's very interesting. Man. That's pretty cool work. Our show music is by Kevin McLeod. If you enjoy his music and want to find out more of what he's created, you can go to incomputech.com. Thank you for listening to our spooktacular Book Reports Podcast Halloween Special. Goodbye. Oh. <laughs> get, get, get that dog out of here. <laughs> I think I think that's a fine a fine ending. <laughs>